Welcome class. My name, Mr. Green. I'll be your substitute host for today. Let's get started. As you may have heard, James had a heart attack. He's doing fine. And we're obviously giving him time to recover because we want to keep the show going for you guys. That's why I'm here. My name is Bruce. Now, back to the show. Do you like burnouts? Who doesn't? Is your version of doing your civic duty waking up your neighbors with the howl of your V8? I do that every morning with my demon. I'm sorry, neighbors. You put barbecue sauce on everything, even your veggies. Do I have a car for you? It's the muscle boy legend that needs no introduction. Well, except for the stuff I just, that was the introduction. Uh, either way, this is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Dodge Challenger. This story of the Challenger goes all the way back to May 1st, 1959. Dodge first used the Challenger name on a special edition model of their two-door sedan, the Coronet. This single year option was used as a special promotion to drum up some summer sales. Market is the car with extra features at no extra cost. It got upgraded interior, white wall tires, sun visors, electric windshield wipers, and wall to wall deep pile carpeting. Who doesn't love some deep pile carpet? I don't even know what that is. Soon after Ford released the Mustang in 1964, small and sporty cars started to give way to bigger and beefier muscle machines with powerful V8s. The kind of cars I like. <laughs> Chrysler already had a pony car of their own to battle the Stang, arguably the very first one, the Plymouth Barracuda. There's an episode of Up to Speed on it. Check it out after this to feed your Mopar monster even more. But Chrysler wanted a new model that could go toe to toe with Ford's higher end Mustang, the Mercury Cougar. <laughs> I love that name. The car designed to do the job, the Dodge Challenger. It took 11 years for them to bring the name back, this time as its own unique model instead of just an option package. This new Challenger entering the ring was built not only to handle engines ranging from a Baby Bear Slant 6 to a Big Bear 440B8, but also to class things up a bit. The big wigs at Chrysler wanted to attract youths with more cash in their pockets. You know, the kids. <laughs> Sell a slightly fancier version to customers so they could stunt on Bruce from down the block. No one's stunting on me, ever. You hear me? Youths? No one's stunting on me. This was a popular move back in the day. In addition to Ford's Mercury Cougar, Pontiac released the Firebird, a higher-end Camaro. Heck, it's still popular to do. Look at the Lexus LX570 and the Toyota Land Cruiser. There's always a market for someone looking to one-up a Bruce. You're not gonna do it though. I'm sorry. To fit the larger V8s, engineers came up with a new platform called the E-Body. The job of designing the exterior went to Carl Cameron, the same dude who designed the Charger back in 1966. He took an old sketch he'd drawn up from an unsuccessful Charger prototype and implemented his design into the Challenger's grille. The body was given the Coke bottle treatment, with the rear quarter flaring out and meeting up with the sharp body lines that ran the length of the car, so it's kind of like that. Ooh, yeah. If you're a muscle car noob like I once was, you might think the Challenger and Barracuda look identical. They do look similar, but in fact, they share zero body panels with each other. Some of the more notable differences are the headlights, grills, and taillights. The Challenger also got dolled up with chrome trim and more luxurious interior materials. Just fancier enough to sell as a premium pony car. Underneath the Coke bottle shaped Challenger was a traditional Chrysler unibody. You got your semi-elliptical leaf springs and your live rear axle. You got your torsion bar front suspension. You got your side impact beams and collapsible steering column, AC, power brakes, power steering, all the good stuff, but not what buyers actually came for. They came for the option that gave them, of course, more power, baby. You know it. Under the hood, there were nine, that's right, nine engine options. It was a veritable horsepower buffet. All right, you ready for this? Here we go. You get a 198 slant six or a 225 slant six. You get a 318 or a 340 or a 360 V8. Or you could bump up to a 383 V8 or even the 440 cubic inch V8 with a four barrel carb or the six pack. Last but not least, you could opt for the 425 horsepower 426 cubic inch Hemi. Yes, the Hemi. It was no ordinary horsepower buffet. We're talking steak and lobster here, people. go and you see all those options, your friends are going to pressure you into buying the top one. Just do it. Just buy the top one. <laughs> because otherwise they're going to give you for years. <laughs> uh, actually, it wasn't the Demon, it was a Camaro. When I went to buy a Camaro, they were like, you can't buy a V6 Camaro. And I was like, really? I got to spend the, I got to buy the V8? And he's like, yeah, you got to buy the V8. And he was right. 
So I bought the SS. <laughs> in 1970, the Challenger was originally offered as a two-door hardtop or a convertible in base, special edition, road track, RT, or TA, the Trans Antrim. The performance package was the road track, which you could get with the 446 pack or the 426 Hemi, and an optional four-speed automatic. While the Hemi is the rarer and more desirable engine, of course, it was temperamental. The less finicky 440 with the six pack could edge out a Hemi-powered Challenger on the street. The RT also got the Rally instrument cluster, which included a tack with an 8,000 RPM ceiling and a speedometer that went up to 150 miles per. The 446 pack got you moving from zero to 60 in six seconds flat. It did the quarter in 13.6 seconds at 104 miles per hour. The 426 Hemi got there in 13.4 seconds at 107 miles. During its first year, you could throw some more coin down for the optional and more luxurious SE package. That got you leather seats, a vinyl roof, a formal rear window. <laughs> what is, what's a formal roof? That's a, I'm not even sure what that means. The TA was a special racing homologation trim level only available for the first year. In order to race the SCCA Trans American Sedan Championship, Dodge built a street version of its Challenger race car. They took the 340 engine option, that's the 5.6 liter V8, and added an aluminum intake manifold and three two-barrel carbs to create the 346 pack. Dodge rated it at 290 horsepower, only 15 horsepower more than the original 340 engine. But it was on par with its competition, the Boss 302 Mustang and the Camaro Z28. The TA, or Trans Am, got a matte black fiberglass hood with a functional air scoop, a dual exhaust with chrome-tipped megaphone outlets in front of the rear wheels, and a pistol grip shifter if you went for the four-speed manual. The TA was also one of the first American muscle cars to use different size tires between the front and the rear. Oh, it looks so awesome. I love that. The rear tires, the bigger rear tires look so cool. <laughs> Maybe what made the Challenger a true Mopar classic were the paint and decals. Plum crazy? Hemi orange? Bumblebee stripes? Come over here, I'm, I'm gonna buzz ya. But don't, don't ever say that. If you drive by somebody, don't ever say you're gonna buzz them, because that sounds stupid. You can even customize the front end with a twin scoop hood or the infamous shaker hood. It's called shaker because the intake sticking out of the hood shakes when the motor is running. I had no idea. That's so cool. In the first year alone, Chrysler sold over 83,000 Challengers. But by 1971, the pony car craze was already slowing down. They dropped the SE, TA, and RT convertible models. The 446 pack and 426 Hemi stuck around for 71, but by 1972, they were gone too. You could only get a hard top model then. The federal government mandated new safety standards a year later, which meant the Challenger got five mile per hour bumpers with big rubber guards that stuck out from the bodywork. And in 1974, production came to an end. Nearly 170,000 first gen Challengers were sold during its five year run. But let's say you're alive and well in the 70s and you missed out on a Challenger. Unlike me. <laughs> I had to think about it for a second. Bum that high horsepower pony car is no more and wishing Dodge would bring back the glorious muscle machines of years past. One day, you pick up your favorite automobile magazine and in bold print on the cover, it reads, the Challenger is back. Could it be? Could your wishes have come true? Did Dodge really bring back the beloved Challenger? Of course they did. It's a badass car. In 1978, Dodge offered a new two-door coupe Challenger imported from Mitsubishi land. It was basically a Gallant with Dodge badging. What? Really? Mitsubishi? That was the same year the U.S. corporate average fuel economy, or CAFE, took effect. So the big gas-guzzling V8s of years past were not making a comeback. But it did have a Hemi in it. The 105 horsepower 2.6 liter inline four Hemi. Mitsubishi had refined the use of balance shafts in its inline four engines to reduce vibration and make them run more smoothly. That paved the way for more four cylinder motors to be used in the States. The second gen Challenger would stick around until 1983 when it was replaced by a rebadged Mitsubishi Conquest. It took 25 long years for the Challenger to make a comeback. And this time, it wasn't a rebadged Japanese import, thank God. At the 2006 Detroit Auto Show, Chrysler unveiled the new Dodge Challenger concept. The new age classic muscle car got everyone all hot and bothered, including me. Consumers wrote letters begging them to make the car. Two years later, their dreams came true. Could it be? Could your wishes have come true? 
based on a shortened Dodge Charger chassis. The Challenger used a slew of parts off their German pals, Mercedes-Benz. The front control arms were borrowed from the W220 S-Class, the five-link rear suspension, trans and rear diff from the W211 E-Class. Not having a manual on the Challenger was a letdown, but what made up for it was that all 2008 models were of the SRT8 variety, meaning you got a 6.1 liter pushrod Hemi V8 pumping out 425 horsepower and 420 pound-feet of torque. <laughs> The SRT8 got you from 0 to 60 in 4.8 seconds, down the quarter in 13.3 seconds at 108 miles an hour, and a drag limited top speed of 168 miles per hour. In 2009, production expanded to add more trims. This time we got the SE and RT, as well as a six-speed transmission and limited slip differential on the SRT8. The Challenger continued to be improved upon over the years with the 392 Hemi coming in 2011. That's a 6.4 liter V8 that made 470 horsepower and 470 pound-feet of torque. <laughs> in 2015, it got a facelift and the introduction of the Hellcat. That Hellcat got a supercharged 6.2 liter Hemi that was rated at 707 horsepower. That's insane. So insane that Dodge decided you needed two keys. A black key, which limits the engine to a paltry 500 horsepower, and a red key unlocks full access to all 707 horsepower. Yes. <laughs> The only thing more ridiculous than a 707 horsepower Challenger is an 840 horsepower Challenger. That's right. 840 horsepower Challenger. Dodge built 3,300 of those demons, and I got one of them. And honestly, it's amazing they even built a single one. They're insane. If the Hellcat was Britney Spears circa 1999, the demon is 2007 shaved head Britney Spears, the one that was showing off her crotch. She's crazy. Demon was a record setter. It was the first production car to be sold with drag radial road tires. It was the first production car to wheelie, which I still haven't done and I need to do it. The first production car to come with a trans brake. And it was the fastest non-electric car to reach 60 miles per hour in 2.3 seconds. And the fastest to do the quarter mile in 9.65 seconds. <laughs> pulls 1.8 Gs during launch, which makes it the hardest launching production car. The NHRA banned it from competition because all sub 10 second drag cars are required to have a roll cage, and it doesn't. If you bought one, you could get the $1 optional demon crate that James actually fit inside, and I did too. I bet we could fit inside together if we tried. That Demon Crate included everything you needed to race the drag strip, skinny front wheels, a floor jack, cordless impact wrench and charger, torque wrench, and ECU for running race gas, and a bunch more cool gearhead goodies. <laughs> if you want an insanely fast muscle car in your garage, this is the one to have. Stay away from mine, though. I'm not telling you where I live. <laughs> Big thanks to Dodge for sponsoring this episode. The Challenger is going strong into 2020, and there are a ton of trims, so you can spec out the perfect modern muscle car today. There's the SXT and the GT models with the 3.6 liter V6, making 305 horsepower. And if you live somewhere with real weather, you can even get an all-wheel drive version of both, something you don't usually see on a muscle car. The GT comes with bigger satin carbon wheels, while the all-wheel drive GT gets retro houndstooth cloth seats, a performance hood, and a splitter. And after that, you're in my favorite town, V8ville. The RT sports the 375 horsepower 5.7 liter Hemi with an electronically controlled active exhaust and a six speed manual. The Scat Pack bumps it up to a 392 Hemi, pushing out 485 horses and 475 pound feet of torque and four piston Brembo brakes. Next up, the iconic SRT Hellcat. This quick kitty gets the supercharged 6.2 liter Hemi pumping out 717 horsepower and 656 pound-feet of torque, enough to sprint down the quarter mile in 11.2 seconds on its lightweight, low-gloss black wheels. The big daddy is the SRT Hellcat Red Eye. Ooh, this is a nice car. With a functional dual snorkel hood, cold air intake, and a higher output Hemi, pumping out 797 horsepower and 707 pound-feet of torque. There's not a quicker muscle car around today. Remember to remove those splitter guards, kids. But I'm not gonna do that because I love it on my car. 
Thank you guys for watching this Up to Speed hosted by your substitute. Please leave a comment below wishing James well. He'll be back soon. What does my engine sound like? Obviously it's got the V8, you know, throaty growl. But then it's got the whine. Like, oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It sounds like I'm just gonna take off. And a message from the legendary James Pumphrey. I love you.